In today's video, we're gonna test $100,000 of running sports science equipment. I've got Jonah here, a former NFL sports scientist, and he's gonna run me through all of these tests, and we're gonna learn what I need to optimize, how I can improve. I'm gonna share that experience with you today. Let's test as many things as I can, see what's working optimally, what maybe is working suboptimally, and then for each athlete, we could say, hey, based on your sport, this system needs to kind of get a little bit of a boost. We know specific interventions that can help that system. And if we bring that little system up and it's not a limiting factor anymore, then we could see some pretty cool performance gains. The first test we're gonna do a survey is just a regular counter movement jump test on a force plate. This is gonna give us information related to how quickly Shervin can produce force. So we're gonna get some asymmetry data between his left and right leg. And that stuff's all gonna be super valuable since these neuromuscular qualities can relate to running performance. We're gonna go hands on hips. I'll tell you when you're good, stay still. Down fast, jump high. Whoa, they have pretty high rates of force development, so you produce force quickly. So that's that's important, which makes sense. You have a good lifting background. So every time you run, when your foot first hits the ground, there's a braking phase. And the braking phase is the ground is pushing force back against you. My muscles, my tendons are gonna stretch to accept that force, and I'm gonna push off, they're gonna shorten and use that force, which is free energy. It's gonna make you a very metabolically efficient runner. And that looked good. The next stuff we're gonna do is look at his left and right leg individually. Good, sir. So as you can see, they're pretty similar, except once we get to this last stage, right before takeoff, we're seeing a little difference between the left and right leg, where the propulsive force from your right leg was actually stronger. So more dominant on the right side. In that one phase of the jump, in the propulsive yeah. phase. Like when that push off of gait cycle, you're producing more force on that leg. Yeah. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite tests for runners. So just here, back up and stick the second one. So this one is actually interesting because now when there's a limited time for you to produce force, so when you're back down on that way down, you actually see a less efficient stretch shortening cycle. Shervin can produce a lot of force when given the time. He's very strong. But in running, our foot's only on the ground for around whatever, 200 to 300 milliseconds. Yeah. You need to be able to produce force quickly. You hit the ground and the force rises very quickly. And then you see here this force drop right here. So the blue line drops again. So because you lost all that free energy, your body in the second phase here had to create that energy by itself with its muscles, which is not very metabolically efficient. It'll make me tired faster. And there you go. Much better way of saying it for <laughs> sure. So this one, what I'm thinking about, as little time on the plate as possible. This yes. is gonna give us a ton of information related to how your foot and ankle functions. Let's get springy. Okay. Yeah. Stiff ankle, stiff foot that can accept forces from the ground and not deform is huge. Good. That one was better. Felt better. That was good. I'm actually impressed by your foot and ankle right oh. now. You got nice feet, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Last one we're gonna do, left and right. Oh. There's definitely a difference between right and left, and we'll look at that some of that after. So we gotta saying? keep doing these tests. Keep doing the test. See, is that we gotta see if it actually thing. translates to running, which I think okay. it should. Okay, yeah. All right, this is part two of the test we're gonna do on a treadmill. We'll do some advanced soles on my feet and then the VO2 master on my face. So we're gonna see what kind of data we get, what we learn, and how I can optimize my running. So this is called area on run. This one's cool because I'm literally the only person in America who has access to this foot pressure mapping technology. And it's really cool because we can see what part of your foot you're putting pressure on, which can give us some really cool information related to stress on different muscles and also like, hey, what running shoe is actually gonna be best for me? Ooh, fancy lights. <laughs> yeah, go heels, toes. Heels, yeah, perfect. Toes. Yeah, you're perfect. Heels, toes. <laughs> I feel like a kid on Christmas right now. <laughs> and on you. And what do we learn? So you can see here, it actually says you're close to midfoot. So you're right below 50% oh, okay. and 50% is 45.1. So you can see location of the center of pressure at the initial ground contact. Contact time, 294, which is above average. So for you, like I said, the people who are typically stronger, more muscularly dominant, they spend more time on the ground because that's gonna give their muscles time to produce force. Ah. It takes longer for muscles to produce force than it would be for a tendon to stretch and recoil. That's why like a tendon springy, elastic dominant strategy is gonna be very metabolically efficient. It's gonna allow you to spend less time on the ground. We can look at your right versus your left. Oh, wow. Which is pretty cool. So we actually, I think there's something here, difference between the average step load between your left and right. I'm not balanced. You're not balanced, which we saw on the force plate a little bit too. So that's cool that it lines up. So then from the other insole stuff you saw, I told you this, your right leg is the major driver of proportion during running. Do most people run lopsided or is that not common? Most people will have asymmetries, but not as large as yours. Okay, how do you build more symmetry? Your body now has adapted the strategy, which maybe is from previous injury, which we see a lot where it's like, I wanna do right leg only, 
I don't want my left leg to do a lot of work even though it's capable of it. So now it's almost just like we have to reteach your body to start utilizing that left leg again. It's a motor control thing. First, I would do it from the weight room and just see if it naturally cleans up. I'm not a big fan of endurance riding and changing form. It's pretty difficult. But maybe if we work on some of your coordination in the weight room, and then we just naturally see what happens. And if it doesn't change, then maybe you approach some of your actual like running biomechanics. This is our third test. We're gonna put these Plantiga soles into my shoes. Affiliate links for all the products mentioned are down below. So we got a bit of a microchip here. We got the insole. It's love chips. Flip. We love chips. It's gonna go right into the insole. Gonna put it right into your shoe. So this little chip right here is gonna give us a lot of valuable information related to your actual ground reaction forces when you run. So like yeah. how much force you're putting into the ground, how much force you're accepting, left versus right, things like how much time you're in the air versus on the ground, all qualities that are really important for running performance. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to look at left versus right differences, but also things like the springiness of each one of your steps, braking versus propulsive forces. And the way I typically would use it is understanding your ground reaction force strategy and your sport of running, and then program some stuff in the weight room based off that. Oh. So as you could see, your load asymmetry was 5% to the right. Your right leg's force production is at 30% asymmetry, which is huge. So you see that on the force plate testing and the insoles. Yes, so it's like, it's confirming a lot of things. Yeah. One leg's doing all the work, that's gonna cause a lot of fatigue on that leg, where the other leg is kind of just along for the ride. So if we can redistribute the forces more evenly, that leg's gonna get less sore. It's gonna allow you to do more high quality work throughout a week. Yeah. It's got to help improve trading adaptations. Wow, interesting. Yeah, because I think I did another test and someone else mentioned, like, did you sprain your ankle on the left side like you're running looks a yeah, little Yeah, you're side. running on your left side. Oh, and I'll, I'll send you, we did some foot, that foot pressure mapping. Yep. Your left foot was just like barely touching the ground. Like I'm just here where the right leg was accepting and producing all the forces. And we see from the foot pressure mapping a lot more stress on that right foot. Interesting. So these are um, trained red oxygen saturation sensors. This technology is sick. Let me just fast track real quick. You have hemoglobin on your red blood cells, which carry oxygen. So this shines the light into your muscle, it bounces back, and it could tell you how much of your hemoglobin has oxygen on it. So that's gonna give us information related to your metabolic threshold, so like zone one through five. It's gonna give us information to like, maybe your muscle is a limiting factor. So just put this one on. You were merely raised in the darkness. <laughs> I was born in it. I'm gonna put one of these on your arm. Non-major working muscle is very important to monitor because yeah. what happens when you get above your second metabolic threshold, where your body's like, okay, we're going for it now. Yeah. It will shift blood away from your bicep and will put it towards your legs. And so with this muscle oxygen saturation sensors, we'll be able to see where that happens. So the point of a step test is we start at a intensity that's below your first metabolic threshold. Every three minutes, we're gonna work up. And so from this, we'll be able to get information related to your first metabolic threshold second metabolic threshold, and then your VO2 max. And another cool thing we got going on today is you're wearing muscle oxygen saturation sensors. It can provide some interesting information if your muscles are a limiting factor from oxygen consumption with all the different markers of muscle oxygen saturation indexes, all his respiratory related markers. So we have things like respiratory frequency, volume of oxygen. We got his speeds up top. We got all things related to his heart rate. Four, three, two, one. You wanna go? You good? Good, he's good, he's good, he's good, he's good. Good, Shervin, good. Did I pass, coach? You pass with flying colors. Flying colors. Flying colors. Kipchoge yet? Eliot Kipchoge is a history maker in Berlin yet again. Uh, we'll get there. <laughs> we will. We're, ah, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you just tell people what they want to hear. <laughs> there you uh, go, you're free. We just finished the VO2 master test, so now we're gonna cut to the results. So here's the test right here. You can see each of these little gray bars represents a step because each step we went up in intensity. So you know, the max pace we hit on that treadmill was six minutes, 40 seconds. That last stage, the three minute stage, your VO2 max was 55, which I know is a new record right. for you. Makes sense because you've been doing some shorter training, um, higher intensity. A lot of times that can have a more potent effect on VO2 max than some of the longer training. How do these land in comparison to average and like elite athletes? Like where does that, um, within that range? VO2 max 55 is not elite. It's yeah. definitely probably like, in terms of human population, like 90th percentile or more. But obviously like, when we're dealing with people like elites, we get like 70, yeah. if not higher. I mean, those, it's like, uh, those guys are really, have really high VO2 maxes. So the other m metric we have here is running economy. And so what we see with the best endurance runners like Kipchoge, those guys who are on breaking two, for a certain running speed, they have a very low energetic cost. They consume less oxygen. It's very easy for them to run at those paces. So these economies are a little high relative to like, 
high end endurance athletes. These are my numbers now. Where would I want to strive to be for a marathon? You probably want to bring that to somewhere in the high 20s, for example, 35 uh -huh. milliliters, which okay, is wow. a good jump. So the next page we have here is your training intensity analysis. So this is the common like zoning. Like, you know, people uh -huh. talk about a three or five zone model. We know what adaptations are going to lead to elite performance based on your event. Let's say it's a marathon. Like, that way we can plan our training in each one of these domains to make sure we're getting the adaptations we desire. So this moderate training, it's going to help induce a lot of aerobic adaptations in your slow twitch muscle fibers. It's going to help you. It's going to maximize your ability to burn fat as fuel, which is a good thing. For you, anything less than 10 minutes a mile, that's your base building. How much is that going to change? Like, will I see changes in two weeks? So I need to retest and find... Yeah, and no, no, it's a great question. So when I first start exercising at a low intensity, especially if I'm new to training, within a few f weeks, I'll see increases in blood volume, increases in plasma volume, red blood cells. All those blood-related variables seem to increase first within a few weeks, and that's gonna lead to some positive adaptations. But then if we think about some of these more structural adaptations, like mitochondria, density increase, capillary increase, those take months typically, which are also aerobic adaptations. And then the last adaptations, which could take years, are like actual increase in our heart's volume or how large it is. We see one of the chambers of your heart actually get larger, your left ventricle, that can take a few years. So within each one of these domains, the adaptations have different time scales based on what we're trying to yeah. induce. But yes. No, we're trying to make a video. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the really cool one. I sent you this is the muscle metabolism. So we have those sensors that you wore on your leg and your arm. So we utilize this to look at the supply of oxygen relative to the demand from the muscle. Your muscles at the end here, they have no oxygen left to pick up. Your tissue saturation is done. It's close to zero. So what that tells us is we need to give your body the ability to send more oxygen to those working muscles so they have the oxygen they need to keep performing. Uh -huh. So you're limited centrally. That's the excellent I point. I need to improve my heart and lungs. Yep. So I think for you, it's going to be a combination of low intensity training like you've been doing. Because some of those adaptations, like you've clearly gotten better, but they could take a while as we just talked about. Like right here, we see the line at the beginning is pretty even. So we want you to spend time there. We want to put your muscle in an environment where it has that O2 supply. The demand is at higher than supply and it could teach itself to work there. The muscle could be like, oh, I have oxygen here now. The demand is too high. Let me practice utilizing this oxygen. And here's your predicted race paces based on some of the math we did behind the scenes. You can run a marathon at a pace between 8.45 to 9.45 minutes a mile. Right now, we can improve. Oh. 8.45 mean not terrible. What is that like a... 340? Really? I put you right at four hours right now. Oh. <laughs> and Garmin put you at what? 405. Okay, so I say you can run a marathon five minutes faster than what Garmin says. Okay. What's your mile prediction? I think like probably 545 to six. Okay, my goal. 545. 540. My goal time is five minutes. Okay. We're running this Sunday, so let's see if that happens. I'm, I'm going to be there, so we'll see what happens. Turn any notifications if you want to see that video. Yeah, exactly. We'll see who's right. Science. <laughs> Or Shervin. <laughs> Shervin. Shervin versus science. <laughs> so based on the recommendations of what I know your goals are, I think we need to increase your body's rate of force development. You're strong enough. Now we need to do things of the weight boom, which are more related to how quickly can I move this weight? How explosive? Like the velocity-based training stuff. The stretch shortening cycle ability, which is my body's ability to accept the forces from the ground, stretch, recoil, not lose any energy. A lot of that's related to weight boom, explosive weight boom lifting, isometric stuff, but also like plyometrics would be really good, I think, for you. I think we do some single leg work to work on the coordination of that left leg, some single leg work on that left leg, so that way it can start taking on the load again, increase your left leg's propulsive abilities. There's one part of our body that interacts with the ground, that actually touches the ground. It's the foot and the ankle, right? But for some reason, not a lot of runners, I've noticed in New York City, do a lot of foot or ankle specific training. It's the first place I've been where that's been the case but it's all one point of contact with the ground. And we can get huge energy leaks because of an inefficient foot. But I think for you, if we do some foot and ankle specific strengthening, it's gonna help your body interact with the ground. You'll be able to take in more of that free energy without leaking well, what it. Is that? Like, what is an example of foot or ankle strengthening? Like That's a band and going like this? No, I'm not a big fan of that. That's actually not gonna put enough weight on your foot okay. to strengthen it. So yeah. let's say like the front of the foot would be elevated, your heel would be floating, and then you'll be like that. That's gonna put a lot more stress on your front foot, which is really important. One where we have your forefoot supported, the back of your foot supported, but my midfoot not. That's gonna put a lot of stress on your meteor arch, that arch here, make that arch strong, which is really important for running. It has its own elastic structures in there, stuff like that. But a lot of like very specific calf and ankle work, I think would be very good for you. And then toe work. So your big toe is a major generator of force, propulsive force when you run forward. It actually does a lot of stuff, like it pushes against the ground and it generates you forward. So actually doing specific interventions to overload that. Because a lot of the typical weight room interventions, like I do a ton of squats, ton of hip thrust, 
like lunges. That stuff is huge for running. They're overloading some of these larger generators, which is really important for things like sprinting, but in endurance running, actually most of the forces are taken up by your calf, your ankle, your feet. So if we could do specific interventions that actually overload those structures versus these, we make those structures really strong. It's really gonna help your running performance, if that makes sense. And then the other recommendation, improve your body's ability to deliver oxygen to the working muscles. That's the central thing. So doing a lot of work below that first threshold to teach our body to have adequate supply. Okay, so once now we have these recommendations, like. I would incorporate them in my training. Like, how often should I retest and, and I adjust? I think the force play test, we, you would retest, like, again, an idea word every week. Mm -hmm. Force play test, the metabolic stuff every six to seven weeks. All right, we're back. Since you enjoyed this video, make sure to go watch all my other videos where I'm doing marathon prep. Go check out Jonah's stuff. His website will be linked down below. If you want to do a test like this, sign up. Let him know I sent you. And if you need a videographer, Brendan's the best. And all the equipment as well, if you're interested, if the companies want their links, I'll have those too.